Okay, just a couple of housekeeping things as we get started. Remember, you have the cards on your table, so write your question. Addy and a couple of other people will be around to pick those up and bring them up to me. Uh, when we get finished, a lot of people like to come up and talk to the speaker, but she has an obligation. The Sumner Scholars are here, and she will be going off with them for a private session with the Sumner Scholars, so that'll be a treat for them and uh, a good chance to be able to ask questions individually. So with that, I'll start with the first question. You mentioned in your book, Linda Johnson comes in as supposed to be a, sort of a conservative de Democrat, moderating the uh, Kennedy. Richard Nixon comes in as, as a conservative, but both of them they get much more liberal in their policies. Why is it conservatives always go liberal and not the other way around? Oh, I don't know the answer to that, but I will say um, both, Johnson was a domestic president, upon whom a war happened, right? And Nixon, but Nixon was a foreign policy president. So Nixon, the, the domestic stuff was just negotiables to him. Uh, 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 he was interested in proving himself a statesman in settling the Vietnam War, in opening China, and so on. Johnson um, just felt the pressure of the war so much with that incredible ramp up from 50,000 men to 500,000 in just a couple years that he was willing to give all sorts of domestic trades to get through the period. So that's... John? Um, one of the things Merrill mentioned is how these programs manage to stick with us. Now, I know it, under the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt designed Social Security so people would feel as if they owned the money in it, even if they took out a lot more than they actually contributed. To what extent did Johnson consciously create these programs to try to make sure that the political support for them reaching into the middle class would make it much harder to roll them back or to reform them? A lot. I mean, the, the if you're going to give, welfare is only part of the story, and I should have spent more time on Social Security, but if you give benefits to middle class people, why shouldn't you give benefits to poor people? Um, and I, I don't know quite what to say beyond that. Uh, it, social, I think it is true that it, it, one of the stories, uh, I'll just give you a, a quick illustration. In 1972, there was an election, and the Democrats, and John knows this better than anyone, who were competing, well, there was Humphrey, there was Muskie, right? I guess McGovern, right? Yes. Yeah, they're all competing. And one of them says, I'm gonna increase Social Security 20%. Remember, this is a period of inflation, just like now. Just like now, when inflation is catching hold. And another one says, I'm gonna increase Social Security 20%. And a third one says, I'm gonna increase it 25%. That was Humphrey. And we began, and we had a massive increase in Social Security benefits at that time. What was the cause? Well, de a Democratic bid war to get the nomination and the voters. But another cause was inflation. They were working out what we think of as colas and, and so on. Inflation makes trouble. And that was the culture. And every time you have a, John Cogan talks about this in his book, which I like very much, The High Cost of Good Intentions. Every time you, supposing you make a benefit for one little group, and then there's some people on the edge who almost qualify for the benefit. This happens with veterans all the time. Are you an Agent Orange casualty or not? If you're in the Agent Orange category, you get this, and if you're not, right, and so on. That somebody that's sort of on the borderline says, it's unfair to neglect me, actually I am an Agent Orange person. And so they widen the description a bit to be humane. And that is how programs get larger and larger, because there's always someone right on the margin who says, why not include me? That's not fair. I suffered as much in the war, um, or in, you know, uh, my income is that low. Uh, so I these programs have a natural tendency to widen over time. We've got some questions about union membership. It was large at one time. It has shrunk over time, the time you were dealing with. But there are some more union, there are union movements sort of picking up now, even in Congress. Um, so what, what happened to the union movement that it was so large and powerful, but then it became fairly weak? If you look at, I think in the back of this book, there's a chart of union membership. 
So there are two kinds of unions, public sector unions and private sector unions. We're talking right this sec about private sector unions. The private sector union members, membership plummeted. We used, John and I used to have a chart at the Wall Street Journal because it came out every year and we'd run it every year and show it was going down. So you go from, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know the share, but it was a large share of the workforce. Since one of you tell me. 25 percent. 20, 25, 25. Yeah, 25 going down to 10 or less, um, even including public sector. And that, what happened was the companies that, uh, one thing is the companies that employed union members shrank. I, I, you know, it really, the murder of Detroit and Flint, when you watch those Michael Moore videos, the murder of Detroit and Flint what didn't have to do with rep. It, they, they priced themselves out of prosperity. The, it was a fatal contract between the automakers and the UAW and the AFL-CIO. They rendered themselves uncompetitive and hurt their workers decade in, decade out, so the growth stayed away from those places. If Michigan had grown, we would have continued to be able to afford all the benefits um, that the union workers wanted. Um, but they shrank, so, so that was a big factor. And then American disillusionment with unions um, particularly, um, I mean, there, there are some hot points like battles over uh, union funds used for politics. Uh, there are many legal cases about that. So Americans said, what do I need this for? And when you have a time, if there's a pushback, as now, where suddenly young people think maybe I should be in the union, that often coincides with inflation. Well, this resonates with me on a personal level. Uh, they're Texans of a certain age who remember black taggers. Black taggers were people who had Michigan license plates because they were black and with a yellow on it. And um, my family on my father's side grew up partly in Flint, Michigan and in Saginaw, uh, which was a big auto town. They came to Texas in the late 1970s because of the collapse of the automobile industry because they had priced themselves out of prosperity. So a big chunk of my family now lives in Frisco, Plano, and Richardson because of the unions. And be, they, they basically forced people to move to Texas for job opportunities. The um, these growth of government bureaucracy is huge. Is that going to be an impediment to being able to do any serious reform? Well, it, it always is. And you see a lot of the agencies, I just, this is a long book, but I describe all the new agencies from the 30s and then from the 60s. It's always an impediment to reform, though you see some legal, legal cases relating to what we call, relating to deference to, to expert courts, what we call Chevron deference. Um, is some of the, it, there's one group that, that fights bureaucratic decision making, particularly in administrative courts, such as the National Labor Relations Board. Expert courts are a big problem, and that's being assailed in our courts at the, at the Supreme Court level. But it's very hard to explain why an authority is a problem. It, you know, you think of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Who does that report to? TVA. Well, it sort of reports to the president, but it's, it, commissions and authorities are always problematic and also hard to get rid of because there's no direct chain of command. That's one of the features of our progressive impulses in the United States. When something's called a commission or an authority, you have to watch out because it's jurisdictionally in between and therefore hard to change. Um, in the book, I talk a lot about pruitt Igo, which is a tragic housing project in St. Louis, one of the biggest. Um, and it failed, one, because uh, St. Louis failed to grow. Again, the problem I, I, I mentioned before, the way everyone expected. The jobs went to cheaper states, but also because it, it was sort of between jurisdictions, that bureaucracy, that well, the St. Louis Housing Authority was in charge of pruitt Igo in St. Louis, and maybe the Housing Department was in charge, and maybe the city of St. Louis was in charge, but it was somewhere in between, and so nobody took care of it. Uh, and and that, that's the problem we're confronting. So Amity, something that you said in your speech really hit home with me, which is that the AFL-CIO represented 10 million votes in 1964. 
well, I've, you know, this is a border state we're speaking in, and we have had over 2.4 million illegal crossings in the last year along the southern border. I think that's in part linked to the unions because in 1964, Lyndon Johnson wanted that AFL-CI vote. He wanted Walter Ruther's support. The price of it was to get rid of the Bracero program, which was the work visa program that they had, which allowed people to come from Mexico, work for a time in the US, and most of the Mexicans wanted to go back home and build their house in Guanajuato with the money they earned in the US because the border was fluid. Well, when you ended the Bracero program, we went from, Eisenhower had created the Bracero program and expanded it, so we had a border crisis in the 50s. By the early 1960s, the border crisis had been solved. We had only 35,000 illegal arrests in 1960. Johnson ended the Bracero program, and now we have over two million, and we've had over a million ever since. What, to what extent do you think the unions may have played a role in, because they wanted to get rid of cheap labor and competitive labor, may have created a role in our immigration crisis? I don't, I don't know enough about that to answer it, but I do know um, that one thing that happened related was when we passed the Economic Opportunity Act, Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, um, and I, again, this is something I didn't know until I researched this book, went to the University of Chicago to give a law school commencement speech. And in that speech, uh, which was like 64, something like that, um, he said, Attorney General, effectively, it's not good enough for you to work in a law firm and then do some pro bono. You should devote yourself, dear young lawyer, idealist, to working in a public interest law firm. And at that time, there weren't a lot of them. There was the ACLU and the NAACP and what all, right? Uh, uh, but this idea of a full-time job doing only idealistic work, changing policy, not individual cases, class action type cases, that was really new. And what gave, why what um, Attorney General Kennedy said mattered was, we had a new law, the Economic Opportunity Act, that funded public interest law firms. That's a huge change, just as with the Braceros program, because if a young person, uh, me or you, or goes to work full time for public interest, he has no idea what happens in the private sector. Whereas someone who's a lawyer, progressive or conservative, who works in a firm, well, he is aware what's going on in the private sector because he also or she also has private sector clients. So you can live in a kind of bubble as a public interest lawyer mm. and never see anything about where the money comes from yeah. and what happens to a company when it doesn't have enough money and that the company might fail if you sue it. And that led to a radicalization. And what that has in common with the Bracero story was the, uh, one of the things that the California Rural Legal Assistance Group, which was funded by the federal government, did was work to unionize farmers or farm workers, excuse me, in, in California, famously, right? So, um, I, I am not a paranoid person, and I don't think any of the people I'm describing will work for the Soviet Union or anybody else like that. But they were deeply wrong, and they had more influence than I had ever imagined um, upon our economy, mostly, unfortunately, in a negative fashion. Well, Amity, thank you. We have got to get Amity okay. off with the Sumner Scholars because we had to have a hard stop at 1.30. So join me in thanking Amity Schlaes. Yeah.